Okay, so what, what made you first pick up a paintbrush? Well, my first dwelling was 405 Bleecker Street in New York. I was three years old that I would begin to remember. My mother made sure that she had art materials on the floor, pastels, crayons, and pencils. She made sure that a grand piano was in the house and a Victrola that constantly played Tchaikovsky, Brahms, Caruso, Pedrovsky. She encouraged me artistically to dance to the music, to pick up the pastels and draw. My father would come, he was a newspaper reporter, and he came once or twice a month to take us to the theater. He got passes to all these events. And I was taken to operettas, the ballet, grand opera, the symphony, and also a lot of one-person shows like Cornelia Otis Skinner, Ruth Draper, Harold Kreutzberg, and I saw these great artists as a three-year-old, and I knew that that was what I wanted to do. So I continued to do that and enjoy the theater experiences until my parents decided to separate. My mother moved to Harrisburg, where I had no art lessons at all, but I continued to art. Then we moved to Rose Valley, where she was given a place to live. We were given a place to live free if she would sew costumes at Hedgerow Theater in Pennsylvania. So that's where we were for two more years. So I was in a theatrical atmosphere. She used to take me to the swimming pool in Rose Valley, where people were in swimming suits or swimming trunks, and I could see the bodies of these the muscular and I, she said, this is the closest to life class you'll have. So then after that, she decided it was time to take me to Philadelphia where I could be educated. She took me there, and we decided not to tell my father where we were because he was going to kidnap me. So she took me to Settlement Music School in Philadelphia on Queen Street. And what a neighborhood that was with old push carts, and produce and fabric in bolts on the push carts as well, pulled by horses. You'd hardly see an automobile. Settlement Music School was a big brick building on Catherine Street, or Queen, it was Catherine Street that had all these push carts, it was Queen Street that had the music school. You could hear all the sounds of people practicing violin, sopranos, piano. Once we went in there, you could smell the smell of linseed oil and oil paints coming from the basement. And I knew that this was where I was going to have a new home. So it was my mother who encouraged it. it she couldn't have stopped it my, like my father tried to stop it. He said, you should learn something practical like being a secretary so that you can get a job from 9 to 5. And who do you think you are anyway that you are special? I didn't think I was special, I just knew I was an artist. I was not a stenographer. I think there's something sad about the fact that this town was, it's a beautiful town. And only about three years later, the, the Borax people left because they found better Borax in Boron. The place was abandoned to people who did not take care of it. And a little later on is when I came and found it crumbling, the opera house completely abandoned. It's almost as if it said, take me, do something with me. And I wish I could live forever. The Got first it. time I saw it, through a hole in the wall, the door, I looked at the sunbeam shining on some old roller skates, kangaroo rats were running around. There was a doll's head, just a doll's head, with his blue glass eyes staring at me through the sunbeam. I looked at the space in there and I fell in love with it. I thought, this is the other half of my life. So it didn't take me more than an hour to look up the town manager and decide, that's not the baby. That's our peacock. Uh, it didn't take me more than an hour to decide to move from New York to Death Valley Junction and start a new life, which I did. I never thought it would be as successful as such as it is. I thought I'd teach for a while, perform for a while, and then sell my paintings. 
But the more I performed, the audiences got larger, so there must be something I'm doing right. You've lived here for a long while. Now. Yes, um, 38 years. So yeah, yours is incredible. I mean, I assume this is a lonely place to live, even if you're surrounded by people. It's a. It's an, I'm lonelier in Las Vegas. I mean, all those housing developments, shopping centers, they're all alike. Everything's so commercial. I feel very out of place, like a fish out of water, which I've said before. Even Pahrump is getting that way, that I have to go there for food and the bank. But I, as soon as I can get out and get back here, I'm happy for another week. I painted a uh, Baroque opera house so that the audience would sit in the proper atmosphere for what I'm going to perform. Because I, when I toured, I performed in gymnasiums, lunchrooms, women's clubs, places that had absolutely no atmosphere. And atmosphere is very important to me. So I painted my own opera house. And opera houses have cupids, cherubs. I painted the four doves of peace flying across the ceiling. They always have a beautiful dome, which I painted. But everything fits in there. I have a, a, a raucous audience of Spanish gypsies and Romanian gypsies, but I also have royalty. I have everybody in there, but it's from the past. And what my dedication is to the past is this. It's written in Latin, held by a scroll by a marble statue. The walls of this theater and I dedicate these murals to the past, without which our times would have no beauty. My father disapproved of everything that I wanted to do with my life, completely disapproved. When I was in the National Geographic, 1970, we thought we'd send in a subscription to the magazine, and then he'd open the page and see my picture. He died just before he got that magazine, as if to say, ho, ho, try to win me over. You'll never do that. Wow. Now, my father, all his life, had the habit of thanking people for giving me a job, which I hated because I got these jobs on my own merit. So after he died, when Wilgett and I, my partner, were walking down the colonnade two days before he died, this figure came out of the darkness and said to Wilgett, I want to thank you for taking care of Marta for 23 years, and then disappeared. I was told by a psychic friend of mine that that was my father. He continues to thank people. Any, any thoughts on, on why they, they seem to what? talk to you? I think it's because when I came into the world, I knew exactly what I wanted to do with my life. So it would be easy for a spirit to kind of guide me that way. My mother did that very much when I was small, but then she became very possessive as the years went by. You'll read my book about that, too. But I never deviated. The only time I deviated from my plan of what I wanted to do, I was very disillusioned when I was 24 about Broadway and the dance world, and I gave it up and became a fashion model. I worked for Vogue and Harper's Bazaar at the same time for two and a half years. And one day, Mrs. Montgomery of Vogue magazine drove me up for a hat sitting, and she said, you know, Marta, I've got to talk to you about something personal. I'm going to suggest that you have some surgery done on your legs because they look too strong for our clientele. I said, what? Yes, we like our models to look like kept women. I said, would I ever be able to dance again? She said, well, no, of course, you'd be a Vogue model. And I said, I'm sorry, I can't, I'm not going to go through with anything like that. This is just an in-between. So one night I was doing some artwork for a client, and the radio was playing Chopin. Now, remember, I had stopped dancing for two years. And I started doodling a dancer resting. And all of a sudden, in a high, squeaky voice, I said to my mother, Mother, I've got to get back to my dancing. This is no life. This is horrible. She said, Anything you want, dear, is fine with mother, you know. The next day, I did my modeling rounds because they don't take much up here. That night, I put on my tights, 
my ballet shoes and my tunic. I stood in front of the mirror, and I was thin all right, but I, my muscle had just... I st tried to do things, and they shook. I mean, to stop for two years it was just... I went through that procedure for eight weeks, and finally I said, I'm strong enough to rent a studio uptown. I'm going to rent a studio and do toe work. I'm going to get my, my, my ballet back. Finally, it was back, and what was I going to do with it? I got my old job back at Radio City for the time being. But I think that that experience, when I talked in a squeaky voice and I suddenly shook all over, I was being shaken up by a spirit. Wake up to who you really are. I was going to the theater to get something I had left. I opened the door, and the sunlight thrown in on the stage, and then I quickly shut the door, and I saw this camera up on the stage. And I thought, oh my gosh, uh, they're photographing the theater. They're looking for spirits. I better get out of here fast, so I did. They, the party took the tape home and played it, and there were heavy boot steps, boom, 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 up the stairs to the stage. They told me that. I said, well, I want to hear that. They loaned me the tape. All that period where the boot steps were was all white like snow. Wow. I said I couldn't hear it. I wanted to hear it to see if I recognized the sound of those boots on the floor. They took the tape home. The boots were back again. I was not supposed to see it. While I was waiting in here to watch the tape, the lights all lowered like they were dimmed in a theater. They were lowered. Wow. Like it was scary. Yeah. Right after the show, I was cleaning my cat boxes, and I heard this deep male voice in the front room. I mean, it was as clear as a bell. I couldn't understand what it said, but it was giving directions to some. Then all of a sudden, it was cut off like a radio interference. Wow. I don't know who it was. So these, these occurrences happen really frequently for you? Then. Well, maybe three or four times a year. I mean, that's a frequent, I would think, for, you know, yeah, considering that somebody could live a lifetime and not have one of these experiences. Well, that's true, but yeah. this town sort of begs for it, I think. You might be right, yeah. There's a lot of history here. It's not, do by you, your European standards, it's not old, but... How, how do you find it affects people when they come here? I mean, like I, mean, I was t telling you earlier about how that first visit I had, I, I was affected by it when I went back, you know, and, and it made me change things. Some tourists are affected when they go into room 22 even, that was the Red Skelton room. Now, Red Skelton never minded the baby crying. He said, let it cry. You know, he, he was very relaxed. Just explain what happens in room 24, what, what people say, what, what people report from it. Well, I had a woman that worked for us staying in that room for a while, and she said there was a light bulb in the ceiling that would turn red all of a sudden. She felt very uncomfortable in the room, but that was about all. Then her daughter-in-law stayed in that room, and the red light still continued to turn on and off like that by itself. And she felt very uncomfortable. That room is right next to Spooky Hollow. Now room 22 is right next to room 24. There's, there's a baby that cries in the wall. That's not the baby. That's <laughs> <laughs> People have heard a baby in the the wall of room 24, and it's also heard in room 22. And a lot of tourists who have come here to try to check into that room, they want their money back, we give it to them. This has happened two or three times. Then after a while, somebody will come in and rent the room, and there's no baby crying. It's perfectly clear, so they stay in the room all night. Room 24 has been closed for quite a while. We're 